Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Madar Kafelasi, and just before we start, I'd like to invite you to check out our new and improved website, where you can find all our latest content and events from the heart of the state of Israel. So please check it out and subscribe to ILTV.tv. And now coming up in today's newscast. The deadline for the formation of the new coalition ends at midnight. Will Netanyahu announce his new government? A 97-year-old Nazi secretary has been convicted for her role in over 10,500 murders in what may be the last trial of its kind in Germany. And just in time for Christmas, Israeli archaeologists uncover a Christian chapel in what is believed to be the burial cave of Salome, newborn Jesus' nurse. Today is the day the Prime Minister designate Benjamin Netanyahu will have to announce to Israeli President Yitzhak Herzog Allah Beyadi, or that he has been able to put together a coalition. It's been two months since the Israeli election results, and while many political analysts believe that Netanyahu would form his government within a matter of days, the negotiations with right wing and ultra orthodox parties have taken longer than most expected. Still, this has not prevented the incoming coalition from pushing forward and bringing a string of new and controversial legislation to the Israeli Knesset this past week. Among the legislation includes the police law introduced by Utsma Yehudit party leader Itamar Ben Gvir, which seeks to grant the minister broader control over the police budget and investigations. The Deri law, which aims to enable Shas party leader Arya Deri to serve as a minister in the government despite his past convictions. And the Smotrich law, which would enable Jewish home party leader Betsali Smotrich to serve as a minister with in the defense ministry, granting him authority over Judea and Samaria. Yet despite the controversial ministers and laws, many Israelis happy that finally, after two years and five elections, Israel will finally, hopefully, have a stable government. And now it's no secret that the United States, under the Biden administration, has publicly expressed concern over the incoming right-wing Israeli government. And so, according to a new report in Politico, the administration has decided to make it all about Benjamin Netanyahu. Let's take a look. The Biden administration will hold the presumptive Israeli prime minister personally responsible for the actions of his more extreme cabinet members, especially if they lead to policies that endanger a two-state solution, according to a new report published Tuesday in Politico. The report cites two unnamed U.S. officials familiar with the issue. According to the report, Netanyahu is the person U.S. officials will publicly turn to, refer to, and rely upon for any remotely serious talks on issues ranging from Israeli settlements in Judea and Samaria to Israel's relations with the Arab states. One official is quoted as saying, quote, Bibi says he can control his government, so let's see him do just that, end quote. The U.S. officials also told Politico they have options in the works and that Netanyahu can expect much more than sharply worded news releases from the State Department. The second U.S. official pointed out that Netanyahu has certain goals, from reining in Iran's terror regime and preventing it from acquiring nuclear weapons, to normalizing ties with Saudi Arabia as part of the Abram Accords, and said that Netanyahu will need U.S. support for these priorities, which are potential points of leverage. He is quoted as saying, Netanyahu wants a bunch of stuff from us, it's a two-way street. We'll work with him on the things he cares about, and he'll work on the things we care about. The U.S. officials also acknowledge that American rhetoric towards Israel matters, threatening that right now they've been measured since the government has yet to be formed, but warned that, quote, we could turn up the criticism very quickly. And joining us now with more on politics and the new coalition is political analyst and editor of HistoryCentral.com, Mark Schulman. Mark, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Okay, so today is the day, the deadline for the new government. It's been nearly two months since the election. How is the feeling that this, you know, cycle of elections may finally come to an end? And what is going to happen next? Okay. So first of all, I mean, the feeling is on one level, like it was said, uh, relief. On the other level, of course, half the country is very upset and very concerned. So it's really hard to say it's it's relief on, on that level. Now, He's going to announce to the president that he came to that he has now formed the government. He can lie about that, to be honest with you. He doesn't really have to have the government. He doesn't have to present his government until it, officially in the Knesset. The Knesset is not going to meet again in full session until next Monday. So he has some more time to play, even though legally he's supposed to be able to say 
that the government has been formed. But we've no, pre, Israeli prime ministers have known to play a little bit loose with this whole issue of I formed the government or not. And certainly Netanyahu has been known for that, uh, without a doubt. So at that point, um, the Knesset will meet next Monday. Assuming that he's actually formed the government, he'll announce that. Now, he wants to pass all these additional laws, which will take all of next week to pass. He might be able to get them all done by Thursday and have the government sworn in on Thursday. The more likely date is the following week. Uh, so the 1st of January or 2nd of January is a more likely date for the government to be sworn in, which is an amazing two, really two months after the election to form this government. Mm -hmm. And so, so a new year, four years because a new year a new and government. a new government. Yes. And, you know, what are some of the right. major policy issues that this new government will seek to address? Okay, so there are a couple of different levels we can look at that. There's the policy issues that concern some of the members of the coalition. So number one, of course, uh, Ben Gvir has been talking about increasing police presence in the Negev and dealing, bring, bring back control to those areas. Um, it's, of course, something that's very easy to talk about and very hard to actually bring about and do. Um, Bitsal Shmutridge and his party are trying to um, annex officially or unofficially as much of the West Bank as possible. That's what they care about. That's clearly what they've discussed in the, in the negotiations. They have not negotiated at all about the job that he's going to do as Minister of Economics, uh, excuse me, Finance, excuse me. So we have absolutely no idea what he's going to do other than his general beliefs, but there was nothing in the coalition agreement to relate to his primary jobs. The ultra-Orthodox parties want to roll back everything that the pre previous government did and, of course, want to increase the funding to their schools without having to, to study basic studies, which was an attempt by the previous government and it's been the attempt all, all these years to get the ultra-Orthodox to provide really basic studies of math, uh, science, and, more, and English to their students so that they can go out and get real jobs after they finish the yeshiva studies. This new government is going to give up on all of that because that's part of the agreement. Uh, any government's going to have to deal with the housing crisis, um, and it's going to be particularly problematic now because uh, the number of new buildings have, that have started have now dropped. Um, and, what do know, they want to deal with? That's mm -hmm. unknown. So, you know, the new coalition, though, it's, it's, it's already causing a great deal of controversy. The United States, uh, you know, I want to touch about this uh, a Politico uh, article saying that it will hold Netanyahu personally accountable for the actions of his ministers. I mean, what do you make of this? Well, look, the reality is this is a for the two, two levels. First of all, understand the fact that Netanyahu himself is not exactly someone who is well-trusted amongst, let's say, democratic circles in Washington. I won't talk about the Republican circle, but amongst democratic circles. And previous presidents, there isn't a, previous, there isn't a president alive of the United States who trusts Netanyahu, frankly. I mean, if you listen, look at all of the memoirs, all of them talk about the fact that uh, he goes back on his word, let's put it that way, mildly. Um, so there's that level of lack of trust. There's also the issue, again, what its coalition partners want, uh, particularly the National Religious Party, including Ben Gvir, is some version of annexation of the West Bank, which goes against all of American foreign policy statements relating to the conflict. The United States is publicly committed to a two-state solution, um, and that's what they believe in very strongly. Clearly, Netanyahu's coalition partners, certainly the religious Zionists, oppose that idea vigorously, and to a lesser extent than they could do. So we're going to see some pushback there and some issues that may become problematic relating to that. Look, it's going to come down to actual policies. And one of the problems we have right now is, at least based on the negotiations, Netanyahu is going to be a weak prime minister. In other words, he needs, uh, he needs his coalition partners to do something relating to his trial, uh, to change the law or whatever might be done to do that. Until that's done, he's putty in their hands to some extent. That's the reason why he gave in to so many of the demands. So the question is going to come down, to come down to when they demand something, and especially now we've heard in the last day or so, changing the status quo on the Temple Mount, something that's been extremely incendiary, to say the least. Uh, when they demand those changes, is he going to be able to say no because it's bad for the state of Israel, or is he going to feel he has no choice but to say yes? And, and, and that's really what it's going to come down to. All right, Netanyahu it's by be, himself is a very, very cautious leader. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. And, of course, we will continue to keep a close eye. Mark Schulman, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. My pleasure.
And moving on, Israel says that it will hold the body of a notorious terrorist who died in prison for potential exchange for two Israelis and the bodies of two soldiers held in Gaza. Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade co-founder Nasser Abu Hamid died of cancer this weekend, and the family is demanding the body. ILTV Steve Leibovitz reports. Convicted mass murderer Nasser Abu Hamid died of cancer in a Tel Aviv hospital over the weekend. Instead of returning the body to the family for burial as his usual practice, Defense Minister Benny Gantz announced that the body will be held by Israel as part of efforts to reach a deal to return two live Israelis and the bodies of two IDF soldiers being held by Hamas in Gaza. Abu Hamid, aged 50, was co-founder of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, the armed wing of the Fatah movement led by Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. He was convicted of killing seven Israelis and planning other attacks during the Second Intifada. He was serving multiple life sentences and has been in prison since 2002. Israel Prison Services says that Abu Hamid received close and continuous treatment for his lung cancer. His family was allowed to visit him in prison before he died. The family says it will not open a mourning tent without the body. Four Israeli families have waited a long time to be reunited with their loved ones. The bodies of IDF soldiers Aron Shaul and Hadar Golding have been kept in Gaza since the war in 2014. Israeli civilians being held prisoner in Gaza are Ethiopian Jewish immigrant Avner Mengistu, who disappeared into Gaza in 2014, and Hisham al-Sayyad, an Israeli Arab who entered Gaza in 2015. And in other news, a 97-year-old German woman was convicted for her role in the murder of over 10,500 people during the Holocaust in what is likely to be the final trial of its kind. German court handed 97-year-old Ermgrad Furchner a two-year suspended sentence for contributing to the murder of 10,505 people during her time working at the Nazi-run Stutthof concentration camp in Poland. Das Gericht ist nach Durchführung der Beweisaufnahme zu über der Überzeugung gelangt, dass die Angeklagte durch ihre Tätigkeit als Stenotypistin in der Kommandantur des Konzentrationslagers Stutthof wissentlich und willentlich unterstützt hat, dass mehr als 10.500 Gefangene grausam durch Vergasung durch die lebensfeindlichen Bedingungen im Lager, durch Verbringung in das Vernichtungslager Auschwitz-Birkenau sowie durch Verschickung auf die Todesmärsche getötet wurden. From 1943 to 1945, Furchner, then 18 years old, worked as a stenographer and typist at the Stutthof camp. Furchner is the first woman in decades to be tried in Germany for Nazi-era crimes. And since she was an adolescent at the time, she was tried in a juvenile court. Furchner went on the run weeks before her trial was set to begin, but was apprehended by authorities after several hours. It is estimated that around 65,000 people, including political prisoners and Jews, died at the Nazi concentration camp located near Gdansk in Poland. The trial included testimonies from Stutthof camp survivors offering horrific accounts of their time in the camp. Furchner's lawyers called for an acquittal, saying the evidence presented in the trial had not shown beyond doubt that she was aware of the murders. Nur eine Sekretärin, das lässt sich einfach sagen, aber die Rolle, die auch eine Sekretärin damals in, dem Bürokrat, in der Bürokratie des KZ hatte, die ist halt eine bedeutende. Der Nachweisen, was hat sie geschrieben, dieser Nachweis, was hat sie geschrieben. Wir haben sämtliche Dokumente, die übrig geblieben sind aus dem KZ, sind alle untersucht worden, ob wir ihre Unterschrift finden, ob wir einen Kürzel darauf finden. Und das war eine immense Arbeit, die geleistet werden muss. Und das kann nicht verglichen werden mit den Verfahren, die gegen KZ-Wachmänner geführt wurden. While Furchner remained quiet during her trial, at the end, she made a statement saying she regretted being in Stutthof at the time. And just in time for Christmas, fresh excavations near Jerusalem have uncovered evidence of a cave believed to be the burial place of Salumi, the nurse to the newborn Jesus. All the details in the following report. The Israel Antiquities Authority has uncovered evidence of a cave believed to be the burial place of Salumi, the nurse to baby Jesus, finding that it was both an important Jewish tomb but also a Christian pilgrimage site. The site, about 35 kilometers or 22 miles southwest of Jerusalem, has been known for generations as the Cave of Salumi. We are sitting in the cave, the, what's called Holy Saluma Cave. According to a, a local Christian tradition, Salumi was the midwife that helped Mary, the mother of Jesus, give birth to Jesus over there in Bethlehem. She didn't believe that Mary stayed virgin. 
because of that, her hand just froze in the air. The minute she touched Jesus' cot, her hand came back to life. That meant from then, she became holy for Christians. According to the Israeli Antiquities Authority, work to prepare the 2,000-year-old cave for public access unearthed a 350-square-meter forecourt, whose stone slabs and mosaic floors are consistent with the family tomb for prominent Jews. Also found were inscriptions, some in Arabic, and decorated oil lamps consistent with the site having served Christian pilgrims, including through to the 9th century after the Muslim conquest of the region. The IAA said that while earlier excavations had located Jewish relics, the big surprise was the adaptation of the cave into a Christian chapel dedicated to Salumi. We knew about the cave at least for 40 years. Everything was very down. But now, during the excavations to open up the cave for the public, we found this big yard, one of the biggest yards in Israel, of uh, uh, the entrance to the burial cave. Uh, we, we, there's almost not, not any yard like that. Um, so during the, the excavations, also we found all the tens of oil lamps. We saw signs of pilgrims. We saw signs of inscriptions. This is all the newest thing in archaeology today in the ex excavations of Israel. And from the latest in archaeology to the latest in technology, Israel is a powerhouse of technology and innovation. But have you ever wondered how you can become a part of this success story? Well, one company, Exit Valley, has sought out to ensure that everyone can have the chance to invest in Israel's promising startups. Israel is known as the startup nation, a small country abundant with unicorns and successful startups on the forefront of technology and innovation. Yet investing in the Israeli high tech industry has been mostly limited to venture capital funds, incubators, and angel investors. While on the other hand, there is often a significant shortage in the supply of investment capital for Israeli companies in their early stages. Now, one company, Exit Valley, is changing the rules of fundraising for startup companies and is making it possible for everybody in the world to invest in startups in consideration for shares, allowing everyone in the world to become part of the startup nation's success. Exit Valley is the first and fastest growing equity-based crowd investing platform in Israel. Founded by the architects of the internet investment industry in Israel, Exit Valley leads the market with the highest number of completed rounds, raising over $65 million so far, and maintaining the largest investor community in Israel. Recently, the company has launched the Exit Valley VC Access Fund, a new investment channel providing Exit Valley investors with a unique opportunity to invest in some of the most promising late-stage private technology companies in Israel and worldwide, alongside leading venture capital and private equity funds. And joining us now with more on investing in Israeli startup companies and the Israeli high-tech ecosystem is Eden Posin, Business Development Manager at Exit Valley. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So first of all, tell me a little bit about Exit Valley. What do you do? So as the video pointed out, uh, uh, Exit Valley was founded with the goal of enabling Israeli startup companies to raise funds directly from the public and thereby giving anyone in the world the opportunity to acquire shares in those startup companies. And we have backed more than 100 companies this way, raising almost $70 million so far. We offer different investment uh, opportunities, different channels that uh, vary from each other in terms of uh, investment amount, uh, the uh, level of the investment risk, and the development stages of the company. So we're kind of a one-stop shop, offering so many benefits to investors. Of course, the worldwide accessibility. Anyone in the world can invest through our platform. And uh, uh, exceptional deal flow, I'm sure I don't have to explain what Israel has to offer in terms of innovation and technology. And we do have access to all this deal flow due to our vast network of connections and uh, relationship with the, the major players in the Israeli ecosystem. Diversity through our platform. Investors can diversify their portfolios, backing companies in different stages of development, different sectors, and using different investment mechanisms. Legal infrastructure, always preserving investment rights, investors' rights. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, the online platform, everything is from the comfort of your home, through the computer or the phone, and uh, uh, years of experience, our human capital. Anyone will get their personal treatment and uh, the attention they require. So really revolutionizing uh, the field of investments in, 
in startups. Now, tell me more about this new VC access fund uh, that you've recently launched. How is it different? Okay, so our major product is the, the angel investment platform, allowing individuals uh, to invest directly in private companies uh, with tickets started from $10,000. And it is suitable uh, normally for early stage to mid stage companies. This new investment channel will allow our investors to participate in deals in late stage, mature, well established companies and under the management of uh, venture capital and private equity funds. The first, VC, uh, the first Exit Valley VC access fund it was partnership with Amplefields Investment, an Israeli private equity fund speci that specializes in secondary deals. The secondary market is where existing shareholders, usually early stage investors, employees and founders sell shares, not as part of an exit event. And uh, among the advantages of the secondary market, we can name the ultimate risk return ratio, relatively quick investment returns, and uh, the opportunity to enter deals on a very attractive discounted price. So uh, how is this different, you ask? This is an exceptional opportunity to enter the VC's world with a relatively low entry ticket of $50,000, which was until now open only to major funds. Angel investors invest in higher amounts and, of course, institutionals. Uh, we are talking about mature pre-IPO companies with a higher potential for exit in the short term. Uh, we are talking about diversifying the portfolio, which is, which is usually built on primary deals. And this is the first time we offer investment in secondary deals. And instead of uh, having to choose investing in one single company, the investors can now distribute their funds between several companies. So if I may summarize, normally this kind of uh, investment amounts are legitimate for single startup, early stage startup, and suddenly an investor can use his capital to distribute it between several late stage companies. You know, it's no secret that right now uh, there's a, a downturn in the global markets, and here in Israel we're not immune. So is now really a good time for people to be investing in Israeli tech? Actually, we think that now is one of the most favorable times for investing in the established assets of the secondary market. These kind of companies, they are not raising fines right now after the major rounds of 2021. And uh, therefore, there are less attractive deals in the primary market, but there are plenty of them in the secondary market. These companies uh, mostly choose to postpone their IPOs and acquisitions in order to maximize their value. But on the other hand, there is a need for liquidity on the part of the employees and the early investors. And therefore, these companies usually initiate secondary deals on very favorable terms with high discounts, something we didn't see in 2020 or 2021, and we will continue to see in 2023. And it's important to remember that we are talking about late stage mature companies that are backed by their revenues. These kind of companies, the economic crisis will have the least effect on. And as the history has taught us, usually crisis times also offer unique wealth creation opportunities, which uh, investors with the available capital can benefit from. All right, thank you, Eden, for taking the time to speak with us today. And for our viewers, if you're interested in investing in the startup nation, you can learn more by visiting exitvalley.com. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. This evening, you can expect wet and rainy weather along with cooler temperatures seeing an average low of about 8 degrees Celsius or 47 Fahrenheit. And then tomorrow, seeing cloudy skies overhead and an average high of 19 Celsius or 65 degrees Fahrenheit. That's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channels on YouTube, Facebook, and Telegram. Subscribe to our ILTV newsletter and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Ladar Gavelazi. Be well and thank you so much for watching.